Alec Head was a successful jockey, a brilliant trainer and breeder and father of cricket and Freddie. He was part of a French racing dynasty that dominated the industry for many years. Now, at the age of 91, he's allowed us to look back at his life and works, which included breeding the great mare, Trev, at his stud, the Arat du Kenne, which is where we met him. Alec, thanks very much indeed for letting us come to, to chat to you. It's a privilege to, to come to your, your wonderful stud. No, pleasure. Uh, can we go back to, to the very beginning? What, what, what are your earliest memories of horse racing and, and horses? Well, you know, I was nearly bought, uh, born in a stable because my dad was a trainer and all our family's been in this business all their life. That's all I know to, uh, to do is horses. Y your father, Willie, was a successful jumps jockey, wasn't he? He was a successful training. jump jockey and a successful trainer. Very good horseman, my dad. He taught me what I know, and I passed it down to my children. So there we go. What were some of the special things that, that he taught you? I couldn't tell you, you know, it's just uh, it's feelings, mm. feelings, the things that you don't learn. That's, that's what it is, really. Yeah, it's about understanding horses. Yeah, you can't explain that to people. You, it's not a thing you learn, it's mm. just something that comes along. And is that because you were surrounded by them? Yeah, you, you know, you, you hear a horse talk all day, all day long. That's been my younger days. Mm. And what was your father's particular, particular skill when it came to training horses? His skill, well, he, he was a top-class horseman. Mm. He understood horses very well, and he was a hell of a professional. As a jockey, he won the, the Grand Steeplechase to Paris, didn't he? Oh, you know, yes, he won a horse called Cook Galway. He was a leading rider, but he was very tall. He had a very, lot of problem with his weight. And he rode a second in the Grand National, beaten by Leicester's grandfather, which was... Wow. Wonderful. I'd like to ask you about um, uh, Le Payon, who uh, you rode in the, in the champion hurdle for your father. Tell us about that. Well, Le Payon was a very good horse. Very, he was a very nervous horse, and that's why my dad put him jumping. He showed mm -hmm. quality on the flat, but he was very nervous. Then we put him jumping. I won at Otoy with him, and then we ran the big race at Cheltenham. But that year, unfortunately, it was flooded. There was a lot of rain, and we couldn't train the horse properly. And it came very early in the season, as you know, Cheltenham. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ran a good race. He was beaten by National Spirit. There was a very good horse in the, at the time. And then from there on, he won the Grand Prix Deauville and the Arc de Triomphe, which I don't think it will ever be done again. No, uh, a unique feat. Um, there's a, there's a lovely story in Sir Peter Sullivan's book about, about Le Pale and, and your father getting a £10 bet on, on Le Pale to win the champion hurdle. Yes, yes. Well, you know, Peter Sullivan used to have a little bet on horses mm. and he used to come round to Chanty every year to, for his paper. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's how I met him first many, many years ago. Yeah. And your father trained plenty of classic winners as well, didn't he? Oh, yes. Well, he trained winners of a very, very big race, really. Mm. Yeah. In France, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so you had a, a tremendous grounding then for your, for your future career. Yes, I was lucky. I had a good uh, foundation. Mm. Uh, and of course, you, once you were old enough and, and strong enough, you, you became a jockey. Tell us, about, tell us about your days in the saddle. Well, yes, I came during the war. You know, I wasn't working very well at school. <laughs> so my mother sent me to school in England. And I, yes, I went to school at Slough. Did you? Yes. And I got the head master involved in racing in those days. <laughs> and I gave him a good French horse who won a, a big race. And he called me up in his office and he said, you know, I had a good bet on the horse you gave me. He <laughs> said, to, I will take you to Ascot for that reason. And that's the first time I went to Ascot before the, the last World War, I saw the Ascot Gold Cup, and it was my uh, 
the, the headmaster who took me there. The other English boys were not very happy, I tell you. <laughs> I bet they weren't. Did you get good grades at school? No, oh, so so. So so. It didn't really matter, though, did it? No. So. And then the war broke out. Then I had to. I came back to France, and I started working. My dad. And we had a hard time, you know, with the Germans occupying the country. And then racing went on again. And I started riding, must have been in 1942. Yes, you won your first race as an apprentice in April 1941. Yeah, in 1941. Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. Yeah, the Maison Lafitte. Maison Lafitte with a horse called uh, Sparkenbrook. I think you were See, my memory comes pretty back good. sometime. Pretty good. I have to have notes. Comes back sometimes. <laughs> you were only 16 years of age then. Did you, did you always want to be a trainer? Did you always want to follow in your father's yeah, footsteps? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I had problems with my weight pretty mm. quickly that came. Then I started riding jumping. I rode quite a bit of jumping. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I trained very early as a young man. I, was, I must have tra started training when I was 23 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about you as a as a trainer then, a highly, highly successful trainer. Did you start out as a, as a public trainer? Oh yes, mm. I started as a public trainer, mostly of jumpers. Right, where was that? In, I was training in Maison Lafitte. Right. And then my first year I went to Rome and to win the big steeplechase in Rome and uh, then things went on. Mm. You were, you, success came to you pretty quickly, didn't it? Uh, yes. You started in 1947 and you were, Leading trainer as early as 1952, so fairly quickly. You yes, got to it came quickly. Yeah, I was lucky; I got nice horses to train. Yeah, how, how did those nice horses come about? Because um, trainers struggle for for years trying to get good owners and good horses. Well, so. yeah, but well, it took me a few years. It mm. didn't come. I mean, that quick. I won. I won the first arc in uh, what was it? 52, was it? 52, there you go. Nuccio. 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 Italian horse. He mm -hmm. ran second the first year, and then I won the following year with him. Tell us a story about how you, how you came to have, the, have him in your yard. Well, Nuccio, I went to Rome and met this man who owned Nuccio called Mr. Baradelli, who was the ch chief organizer of racing in, in Italy in those days. And he sent this horse, Nuccio, to Matti to run the Grand Prix de Paris. The horse didn't run too well. And uh, he called me a few days after. He said, would you take my horse to get him ready for the yard? I, th I was very happy. I was a young man. So I took him and the mm -hmm. horse ran second, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then the Aga Khanda was on the market to buy horses, if there was a good one there. Bought Nucho and left, left the horse with me. And then the following year, I won the arc for him and the Coronation Cup I won with mm -hmm. Nuccio, too. Mm. So that was the start of my association with the Aga Khan family, which was a wonderful time I had with Prince Ali. It was an extraordinary man. Fantastic. I mean, get the, when he told you he was going to leave that horse with you, that was a, well, that a tremendous was, moment. For a young man, yes. a young trainer, you yes. know, when you're struggling. I was really struggling at the time. It was... Uh, Fantastic for me. Uh, and what were they like as a, a as a, a racing operation to deal with? His Highness the Aga Khan, the Aga Khan. Oh, wonderful! Mm -hmm. the, the the grandfather of the, the present Aga Khan was a wonderful man, very wonderful man to train for. He knew he knew the business well. Mm. And then Prince Ali Khan, he he could have tra been trained the horses himself. Could he? Oh yeah, he was a very good mm. horseman. Yeah, and he rode in races too. Yes, yeah. Did they let you um, do your own thing? Did they let you, let oh, you yes, get on with it? Oh, yes. They, they gave me a free hand all yeah. the time. No problem. Yeah. It, was, it was a wonderful association. And I won a lot of races for them. Yeah. I won the Ark. I won the, in England, I won a lot of races for them too. The Guineas and so on. Yeah, so I guess that's one of the keys, isn't it, to being a, a good trainer, is to have owners that aren't pressuring you all the time. Oh, yes. And, and giving you a free hand. Yeah. What about... The sort of innovations that you've seen. I'm thinking in particular about goggles, jockeys wearing goggles. That was something oh. you were involved with, wasn't it? Yeah, jockey wearing goggles. That was at the beginning. That was <laughs> that was something. Now the, it, it's normal. Everybody thinks it's normal. When I won, when I won the Lincolnshire with yeah. a horse called Nah, 
and the jockey rode goggles, the press in England had a big thing about that. This French jockey with his goggles, I remember. <laughs> it was rather strange. Now, nobody takes notice of that. No, no. Amazing. I must say that in my young days, when I rode, the first time I rode at Otay on yeah. the flat, we were right, we were starting on two lines with no goggles on. I never saw anything through the race. No. <laughs> that was incredible. Just dirt. The and dirt in the mud. face. It was incredible. Yeah. We used to start on, on two lines when there were a lot of runners because the tra course Not wasn't wide, wide enough. Mm. The list of winners that you had just goes on and on and on. We could talk about them for, for days and days. But for example, I mean, people that watch Racing UK be interested that you won, you won the Epsom Derby in 1956, didn't you? Yes, that was with Lavonda mm. from Mr. Wertheimer. Yes, yeah. That was a wonderful story too. To win the Derby, English Derby is, for a French trainer, is, you know, something wonderful. Mm. Particularly for the Wertheimers, I suppose. For the Wertheimer, which has been another association mm. that I was involved with for 50 years. Mm. And for them, for the Wertheimer, I used to run the, the, the breeding too. And it Did was, you? Oh, yes. So you used I, to advise them on, on, on yeah, mating and, and buy, breeding? And buy mares and so on for them. Yeah. Yeah, so you always had a you always had a strong interest in the the breeding side of things as well oh, as yes, training. Oh yes, yes. And I bought good horses in England. The sales, you know, like mm. Gay Machine was a good horse I bought there. And in America, Lee Far River Man. I missed Blushing Room. I was the under I was the under bit of really? the Blushing Room. Really? That was a big miss. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> a very big miss. And um, how important. Is, when you're buying a horse, how important is the pedigree? How, how important, how much do you, weight do you put on, on the pedigree as uh, compared to what they look like, their confirmation and that sort of thing? Well, you, pedigree is very important. I, I'm, for, for stayers, for sprinters, it doesn't matter so much. Right. Sprinters can be bred any, so it's a question of, of aptitude. But for the horses that stay a distance, you want a, t a top pedigree. The mm. Bad pedigrees don't work. Yeah, yeah. On, on a on a distance, a classic distance, I would say. So winning the Arc de Triomphe, you need a you need a pedigree. Yeah, you need something strong. Yeah, it's not a fluke. Sure. No fluke. Let's talk a little bit about here, Ara uh, de Kenny, which is a we've just had the privilege to just drive up a little bit. A wonderful place. How did you acquire it? Well, I bought the farm with my dad in 1950. Eight, yes, I think mean fifty-eight. Mm -hmm. This property was built by Macomba, uh, by uh, Vanderbilt. Yes, he American. built Vanderbilt yeah. built the stables. Of course, not the house. The house was built in sixteen hundred, okay. and did all bought all the land around it, made it made it into a stud farm. Mm -hmm. He was very successful, and then when he left France, he sold it to Macomba, and then the war broke out. The Germans occupied this property during the whole of the war. And then it, after the war, it stayed uh, not, not nothing on it. It was just going to hell. Wreck and ruin, was it? Mm. And then Mrs. Uh, McCumber decided to sell it. And I was very lucky to be able to buy it with my dad. Mm. And you know, when we came in, my, uh, my I bought the place in the winter and my dad was training in those days. They were racing in the south of France. And then in February, he said to me, he said, let's go and see the farm we've bought. And when he stepped through the gate, the first words he had to, me, to say to me, he said, you must be mad. We'll ruin ourselves in this property. <laughs> it was in such a bad shape. Was it really? Oh, yeah. Everything had gone wild. You know, the Germans, army, the German army, imagine, all the fences were broken, the mm. doors, and it was all painted in black, you know, against the the, uh, the, the planes, yes. all the boxes and everything. It was in a terrible state. It took us a, quite some years to get it back to what it is today. Was it true that the German general who commanded the whole of Normandy was, yeah, was based he lived, here? Yeah, he lived in the house here. Did he? Mm. And there were bunkers, weren't there, as well, and, and lots oh, of there camouflage. Are there are still some bunkers. We couldn't blow them. They're so big. Really? I, I blew a lot of them away, smaller ones, but there's a couple of big ones we can't blow away. They're too big. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, it took you a long time to renovate the place. Then. Oh, it did, yes, because, you know, we did that steadily. Mm. Yes, it all cost money. Uh, so you, then the idea was to, to recruit stallions for, for the farm. So where, yeah, where did you start? Yeah, we started having stallions when uh, I got the place. Uh, we had many stallions here yes. during my time. Some uh, ones that were better than others, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, stallion mm. is a difficult business. You mm. don't know who's going to hit and who's not going to hit. But on the whole, I've been lucky. We bred good horses like the Fabular. We bred Bering. We bred mm. not arc winners here. Yes. So it, Ra it, Ravinella, she was bred here, wasn't she? Ravinella so was bred here, yeah. yeah. And it was Lucky Dip who you started with as well. Lucky Dip, was, that's right. That was the first stallion I got here, Lucky Dip. Yeah. Was he lucky? He was so-so. <laughs> so-so. Yeah. And I, I was interested to read as well that you stood a Kentucky Derby winner as well in Dancer's yeah. Image. Dancer's Image. How did that come me? about? Well, you know, I thought that... The, to bring a little American blood would be good mm. for our French mares. Yes, yes. He was uh, he was so so. Was I he? stood another American horse called Dapper Dan too. Okay. What was he like? He was okay. Just okay. okay. Yeah. Things got better with the likes of Annabar, however. Oh well, Annabar was that was an, another miracle. Yeah. It's a bit like Trev Annabar. Yeah. There are two miracles in my life. Trev, Anaba, and my wife. <laughs> that makes three. <laughs> yeah. There um, were two without three. Tell us about Anaba then. He was a six times champion sire. Yeah, he was a wonderful Anaba. Anaba, you know, my daughter trained Anaba. And as a two year old, he hurt himself. Mm -hmm. And they got the vets to watch him. And all the vets said he has to be put down. He's a wobbler. So my daughter called me up. He, she said, you know, they want to put this horse down. I said, oh, don't, don't let them do that. I said, we'll talk to Sheikh uh, Hamdam. No, it was uh, Sheikh Maktoum at the time. And I'll take him at the stud and see if I can treat him. So you, they said, OK, take him. So I took him here and kept him for six months. Mm -hmm. And he got better. And I started working him on my training ground here on the farm. And we got him ready and he won a race as a three-year-old. Mm. A small race, a maiden. And then I went to see uh, Sheikh Maktoum. And I said, you know, the horse is much better. I said, if you want, we can have an association do something. Oh, no, he said, I gave you the horse when he was a cripple. He was never worth nothing. A gift is a gift. I won't take him back. Oh, wow. Which I was very happy to hear that, <laughs> as you can imagine. Brilliant. And then the horse, as a four-year-old, came as a champion. Mm. A sprinter. He won the July Cup. And uh, we brought him here, and he became a top stallion. It was a fabulous story. A sad end, because he died fairly early of colics, which was very sad. Mm. And his daughters at Stud are doing very well. He's the leading uh, broodmare sire here in France. Is he? Yeah. Right. He always interested me as a, as a stallion because he, as you say, he was a sprinter. But a lot, a lot of his progeny would stay further than him yeah, as well. They, yeah, they would. They would. Yeah. Well, he had a very he, versatile. He had an interesting pedigree. You know, he was by Danzig out of a French mare. Had a very, very interesting pedigree. Mm. What stallions have you got here at the moment? Here, at the moment, we've got Motivator, of course. Yes, yes. We have a very nice young horse that stood two years in England called Antelo, a son of Galileo. Yes. Very good racehorse, a lovely horse yes. he is. He was at Cheveley Park Stud. For Cheveley while, Park Stud, and we have some lovely falls by him. He's yeah. a nice horse. I think he's going to make something. Then we have Goldie Cover's full brother, uh, Anoda. Mm -hmm. He's a nice horse by Anaba. Of course, he's a young. He had his first year this year, very successful. He was very well received. Bred 140 mares. Then we have another horse called Fisse, mm. whose pr first progeny are two or three. They're young. He's, he's had some winners, and then we've got a horse who came from England called Yumzen, mm. who was three times second <laughs> in the arc. 
who's done quite well. We had a two-year-old winner at Ascot and has a good filly who ran third in the Verme behind Trev. So he seems to be off to a good start. He's a nice horse, you mm. then, very nice horse. Yeah. So, and then we have another young horse that I'm very fond of called Dunkirk mm -hmm. by Highest Honor that we stood here. Yes. It was a very successful stallion, Highest Honor, one of the most successful we had. And this horse, Dunkirk, is doing very well. He hasn't bred many mares because he wasn't a champion. He was only a group three winner. But he's getting very nice horses, very sound. I think if he gets good mares, he's going to show himself what he can do. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a nice bunch of stallions at the moment. We are well equipped. Mm -hmm. has, has the breeding industry changed an awful lot since you, since you first started? Do you think, or has the breed changed in, in particular? I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that. I think what's changed most is the breeders. Right. You know, we get different type of people, and the, the Maktoums came, now yes. the Qataris are there, and then Coolmore is fighting them, and we're doing our best we can mm. with our little crop, with our little horses, but it's, it's always a big fight, really. Yeah. Do you think the breeds become a little bit less, has less constitution than it used to, a little, little bit more infirm than it was, or not? I wouldn't think so. No. Maybe we don't race our horses as much th no. these days as they did in the old days. In the old days, they used to run them much more yeah. and a longer distance. Of course, people have gone now for the short trips and the early two-year-olds. Everybody wants to have two-year-olds to run early. Yes. It wasn't like that in the old days. So that, that is a change, I must say. Yeah, I was thinking about the influence of American blood and, and the medication that they've raced on. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, yes, of course. But uh, the, the American, you know, the, the Americans is one thing. They're, they're, they've got short, running on short distance all the time. Yes. And we're de getting that way now in Europe too. Mm. They've shortened our derby, which I thought was a bit strange. Yes. But it wasn't my decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? It's a shame yeah. because there is there is this focus on sharp early two years, yeah, yeah, getting to the track, and yeah, yeah. people are people don't have the patience I, I no. suspect that they used to no. have. Because it's become a business now, really. Mm. It's a business. It wasn't like that in the old days. You had those rich families who had horses. Yes, they were they were, didn't mind even if they lost money. Now everybody wants to make money in this business. Mm. Indeed, which is. Uh, not easy. Yeah. It strikes me that, that what Cricket did with Trev was that she was very, very patient with her and really patient with her this year. And the owners of the owners, Sheikh John, has been very good and let her just get on with it. Yes. But there's not many, many owners and indeed trainers that are able to be patient with horses. Well, anymore. well, I don't know. That's the, that's the trainer's thing. Mm. Mm. The trainer must have a hand on the owner. Yes. Some trainers do. Monsieur Fab, I'm sure, runs where he wants to. Yes. Yeah. And me, I'm sure that John Gosden or my friend Michael Stout, I'm sure that they, they do it the way they want. Mm. Yes. It's sort of but the younger trainers that start, uh, they're on the hands of their owners, and it's difficult for them to resist what the owner wants to do. Yes. You have to get older for that. and. Have a little more, ho have more horses to be able to resist. Mm. Well, of all of the all of the big winners you've trained, do you look do you look back on any of them, any one single horse with more fondness than others, or not really? That I've trained. Yes. Yes, you know you've got. I think one of the best horses I trained was a horse called Charlottesville that okay. belonged to the Aga, who won the French Derby the mm. year the Prince Ali died. Really. Yeah, he was a very well. I've trained so many good horses. It's very difficult to say which yes. is the best yes. one. Yes, you know there there's a lot of good ones. Depends the year. Sure. This mare now this year is something unbelievable. Mm. Yeah. I would say she's better than anything I've seen. Really, that's yeah. some statement. You look yeah. at the list of winners that you've been involved with. The list is endless. Yeah, well, you think you think this mare Trev is is Trev? Yes, I think she's she's on. 
The way she won the first arc was unbelievable. Mm. When I saw that race, I thought, you know, it's impossible to win. And she did w go to the post, running away, beating a very high field. Mm. When she is sound, she is incredible. Mm. She had a, she had a, she had a, a bad, difficult year last year, didn't oh, she? Oh, terrible. Terrible year. She just got back at the end of the year, luckily, to win a second arc. And then we sent her here to, on the farm at the Kenner for five months, mm. which did her wonderful good. Oh, was that, was that after Ascot when she had... You, you no, 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 after the, she won the arc. Oh, after she won the arc, right. She came, she came here in October after the arc until February mm -hmm. this year. Yes, yes. But then she came, when she went back in February, she was really looking great yeah. and we, feeling great. We got a chance to see her. We've been to see her a number of times through her career, but when we went to look at her this year, before her first run, she looked like a she looked like a different. Or she was moving yeah. better. Well, she looked bigger she's, and stronger. She's grown and she's out of her problems. Mm. Yeah, she's really exceptional. She um, it's interesting that that she she didn't sell as a two year old, isn't it? No, nobody wanted her. I don't, that you know, I the only thing I can think of because she was a nice yearling. Was she, she was my motivator. Yes. At the time, wasn't at all popular. No. I think that's what killed the people of the yeah. sales. You know, they, they go for the stallions. They, if it's right. by stallions that's not popular, they don't even open the, the box. Yes. And I think because the dam had thrown before her a horse yes. called Trois Rois, who was a good horse. Right. Very good horse. So there was no reason that she shouldn't have sold for, mm. you know, 22,000 was a joke. Mm. Yeah. Lucky she didn't, really. Lucky I bought her back. Yeah, absolutely. Her rehabilitation um, has been amazing, really. Cricket's done a great job to get her, get her back to her best. But she was nearly retired, wasn't she? Yes, well, they wanted to retire last year. Yes. Luckily, I stopped them from doing that <laughs> to keep her another year. Yeah. And why, uh, in, in stopping them doing that, are we going back to your gut instinct, your feeling that she should go on, that there is sure. more to come? Why not run us four? Mm. She, she was sound at the end of the year, so uh, let's try at least. That's why I told Sheikh Altani, I said, if she's not well, we won't race her, but let's try. Mm. Mm. And it's, it's been successful because this year she hasn't been beaten yet. Yeah, yeah, she was um, hugely impressive in the Vermeer, wasn't she? Oh, she was unbelievable in the Vermeer. Yeah, yeah. It was like a, a, a dog coming out of a trap in the, in the straight. Mm. Mm. And I ask you about um, her, her first arc, her arc win last year, sorry, when you, um, you watched her last piece of work and you said to Cricket afterwards, didn't you, you've just won the arc? Oh, last year, yeah. I, I was there on the Tuesday before the arc and I liked the way she worked. Yeah, yes. And then I called my friend Peter O'Sullivan. <laughs> I said, get on your bookmake and have a bet on her because yeah. I think she's coming back. And uh, he did, but when I saw him after the race, he wasn't too happy. He thought I was crazy, and he didn't put enough money on. <laughs> At least he had a bit on. Yeah, oh, he did. At least yes. he had a bit on. Uh, she's got. What, what, how would you assess her pedigree? You, uh, oh, it's top pedigree is very good. I bought her grandmother. It comes from the Trillion family, triptych, very good horses. Yes, yes. It, it goes back, this uh, Philly train who was a champion, Morning Cloud, it's the same mm -hmm. family. Yeah. It goes back to the same family. Yes. And the cross with Motivator worked well. Mm. You know, mo we were very lucky to get Motivator. The year Treff came out. Indeed, indeed. Because he's done quite well, Motivator, in Europe, better than in England. Yes, they tend to, his progeny want a little bit of cutting again, don't they? Which, which she they need a little does, cut really. and they need time. You mm. don't want, you, they, they're not precocious horses. You've got to give them a bit of time. Alec, thank you very much indeed. It's been nice a pleasure. Talk. Thank you.